Number 10. Bathing. In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number nine, suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath, even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not gonna say it again, because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Eight, rice water. So the Chinese washed like once a week, that's fine. But how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful, as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locust were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locust keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I mess this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair, though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the home of combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. And they'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five. Lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. 
No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but I think, uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's, let's go, let's go, let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what, I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, they did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning, which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now, how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seem to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps, so, hmm. Number two, water purification. While this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing, I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. To be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, firsthand or otherwise, keep it to yourself, uh, let me know, like down in the comments. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Number 10, Chin Shi Hong. Everybody remembers the first. First man to walk on the moon, first president, and everyone remembers their first kiss, right? Ooh, cringe, I remember mine. Ooh, man. Emperor Hong was the first, ruling from 220 BC to 210 BC. His name is well-renowned in Chinese history. Builder of the Great Wall of China, United China's Warring States, and too many tourists around the world know he's the guy who made the Terracotta Army. This dude was a baller, and if you're to go off by his appearance in Civilization VI, he wants to take all your wonders for himself. Usually the first aren't so great, but he was the first, and he was very powerful. The Terracotta Army is pretty cool. It's amazing how long that lasted. Number nine, Emperor Wu of Han. 
The seventh emperor of the Han Dynasty, Emperor Wu of Han, successfully ruled over China from 141 BC to 87 BC. He is best known for expanding Chinese territories. Emperor Wu was fond of art and poetry and promoted them avidly. He established the famous trade route between East and West, known as the Silk Road. And he also defeated the nomadic, I'm gonna try and pronounce this, Xiongu? Uh, Xiongnu. Zhang, 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 tribes? Zhang new tribes. We're gonna go with that. Sorry, guys. Ugh. Emperor Wu was a follower of Confucianism and applied his doctrine as a code of ethics for running the empire. Through his ideology and effective governance, he unified the nation in real terms. Unifying the nation is going to be an underlying theme here for most of these guys. There was a lot of political strife happening over the years. Number eight, Emperor Wen of Sui. When you're the big bad dude in charge, it's a job that comes with benefits. Live in a beautiful palace, good food, servants, entertainment, wealth beyond your wildest dreams, and just living good. However, being emperor in ancient China came with certain fringe benefits, if you will. They practiced a practice uh, that was the same as uh, some well collared shirted door to door folks in the Southwest. Mormons, you know what I'm talking about? Wives! Uh, why do you have one when you can have many? I don't know about that. Every couple out there will agree with me when I say that, right? Because more husbands and wives is just a good thing. It makes things easier, right? No, they're probably going to disagree with me. That's just what a lot of them did, though. It was the times. Some weren't even wives. They were just concubines. However, Emperor Wen of Sui was different. He looked around him and said, Nah, two's enough for me. Having the willpower only to be awful to two women instead of 50. Nice. Number seven, Emperor Taizong Tang. Here's another one, somewhat uh, nice guy. Emperor Taizong Tang is the kind of politician that you want. Someone who comes in after the previous administration, sees the problem, acknowledges the problem, and then actively tries to fix the problem. With the least amount of lying and campaigning, of course. Where's this guy when you need him, am I right? Tang understood the mistakes that the previous government had made and wanted to rectify this. Specifically, a lot of the peasantry were given more rights as he knew how powerful they could be if working together. This made him rather well liked and remembered for such. Power to the people. Number 6, Empress Wu Zaitan. Listen, this was before the year 2022, and they let a woman not just lead a country, but a whole empire. Maybe we were progressive back then, I don't know. But what I do know is that she was not judged for being a woman, but for being a tough and excellent leader. Quite possibly one of the best, actually. She fought many wars to expand China's borders, and successfully. A lover of the arts and literature, some of which were created and are still around today. She is remembered as the only female emperor of China, but perhaps there should have been more. She's also seen as a female empowerment in the ancient world. A little bit of girl power for you. Girls can do it too. And don't you forget it. Number five, Emperor Puyi, the last emperor of China. Things were looking okay for about five minutes before Puyi suffered the same fate as many other empires did at the turn of the century and shortly into the 20th century. Just take a look at Russia. Ooh. Pu Yi was forced to abdicate his throne, but like many rich and powerful people in the world, they don't really get punished the same as you or I. Remember The Wolf of Wall Street? Couldn't believe the end of that movie. At first, he got to keep a very handsome pension and was allowed to stay in the royal palace for five years before the new government decided that it was a little awkward to share a place with the former evicted tenant. It's a little strange, kind of like squatting. Ugh. He then went on to do some shady dealings with the Imperial Japanese Army during their tour of Asia in the late 1930s. And by shady dealings and tour, he basically was put in control of a puppet Japanese state uh, during their invasion of China and other parts of Asia. Basically, he just signed off on anything the Japanese told him to do. When it was all said and done, he spent some time in a communist jail where he deeply regretted his actions. And I'm sure they made him deeply regret his actions. You don't want to be there. Number four, Emperor Kang Zi. Queen Elizabeth II, Emperor Kang Zi, and how long I spend surfing the internet on the toilet. What do all these things have in common? Well, they all last for a very, very long time. I'll come out when I'm ready. Shout out to all the dudes who use their phones on the toilet. How you doing, boys? Love you. Emperor Kang Zi is one of the longest reigns of any leader in history. That's tough to do in ancient times. Sure, we all love Her Majesty and stay strong, Queen Elizabeth. I love you. 
But these are modern times. Sure, she might have been in some danger when the Germans were about, but she wasn't even queen then, so I don't think that counts. You have to imagine that for every friend the emperor has, there's two more with people with knives behind their backs. Enemy kingdoms, the peasants, your concubines, and their sons. Sometimes even your own administration wants you out or someone in it. He's more known for squashing rebellions and leaving China in a rather good place even after he was gone. Way to go, dude. Yeah, way to go. Right on. Three, Genghis Khan. You might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Chetty. I think you got that wrong. He wasn't the ruler of China. He was the Mongol dude, wasn't he? Well, my dear internet friends, Mongolia was more than just a weird divider between China and Russia like it is today. Yes, before the English discovered tea and spices, the largest and probably the most powerful was that of the Mongol Empire. And during this lengthy and bloody reign, Kangas found himself in the imperial throne. The Mongols couldn't be stopped. If it weren't for the samurai and a couple of bad typhoons, they might have got Japan too. The Mongol Empire stretched from some parts of Europe all the way to Korea and everything in between. They lived under what I would call a Darth Vader clause. Join us or find out who your daddy is. Number two, Pirate Empress. When people talk about pirates, they think about Johnny Depp, the Caribbean, and the pirates that loomed about the part of the world during the golden age of piracy. However, piracy doesn't just mean nice beaches and palm trees. There's piracy all over the world. China was no different. However, what was different was Zhang Yisao, a woman who inherited a pirate empire from her late husband. She worked with it too. She expanded her husband's empire and became the Empress of the Seas. At one point, she commanded 24 ships personally and oversaw a force of 1,400 pirates. She unified other pirates to join her empire with a fleet estimated to be around 400 junks, which is a weird name for a boat, and up to 40,000 pirates, all loyal to the pirate queen. She engaged in combat with the East India Company, Portugal, and the Qing Dynasty. Wow, that's that's actually kind of crazy. You, you learn a lot. You learn a lot here at Bumblebee. I don't, I'll tell you, you learn a lot here. Number one. The chairman. Okay, I know, I know. Not exactly an emperor either, but hear me out. Just hear me out. Emperor is a leader of an empire. What do empires do besides hunt down the treacherous Jedi? Star Wars Day. They expand, absorb, and assimilate places. Mao's China might have been a finger quote modern one, but China wasn't exactly sitting around. Specifically, the Tibetan Chinese conflict in the 50s, just an example. It wasn't exactly a war as it was so much as, hey, I don't really like what's going on over there. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and take that. Thanks. Now, does that sound like a republic or does that sound like imperialism? Mao was a powerful man and did a lot of naughty stuff in his time. And it would take all day for me to get there. But it counts. He's an emperor. It counts. Emperor of communism. The communist emperor. We'll go with that. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Zanzwingdui Ruins. These ruins located in China's southwest province may just provide archaeologists clues on their past. Very recently, this past year as a matter of fact, new artifacts were found, a total of 534 relics. These cultural staples made of bronze, gold, ivory, a couple of these relics have been turning heads and raising eyebrows. This 3,000 year old bronze figure, for example, seems to be holding an ancient wine vessel. And this relic stands a little over one meter. These ruins were luckily discovered during a refurbishment of a primary school, the Sichuan Provincial Cultural Relics and Archaeology Research Institute found over 80 tombs, 60 ash pits, and 10 building zones, all of them dating back to the Western Zhou Dynasty, so back around 770 BC. Researchers have been examining the site for a couple years now, and although the people of Shu left little to no detail on their culture, we're finding all these artifacts that tell us a story, like for example the one pound gold mask found in one of the six sacrificial pits. So we're getting there one beautiful relic at a time. Number nine, seahorses. Ancient Chinese medicine was kind of incredible. Honestly, they had like a kind of sixth sense when it came to how certain things might work. Some of them were pretty questionable, I will say, I'm, I will not lie, but they had something right about seahorses. Even today, you can find seahorses at markets as a street snack, but beyond a tasty treat, they have been used as a part of Chinese medicine since time immemorial. It was believed that they had the potential to cure infertility, baldness, asthma, and arthritis. Research work on seahorses provided information that has the ability to help ease inflammatory symptoms associated with arthritis. A peptide derived from the seahorse species, Hippocampus cuda, proved to be effective towards chromocyte cells. So they were kind of right. It did do something. 
Number eight, magic mirrors. Because of horror movies, it's hard for me to open and close a bathroom mirror. I can't do it. They always do it so slow in the movies as well. I'm like, oh, just slam it. But in ancient China, mirrors were considered a good omen, actually. So much so that after a loved one passed, a mirror was often hung on the ceiling of the burial chambers, you know, to prevent evil spirits from ruining your beauty sleep. If you encountered an evil spirit, the first place you would have to go is near one of these ancient mirrors. So when archaeologists found these 2,000-year-old ancient artifacts, one of these mirrors was still able to reflect images. The world's strongest Windex, there we go. We found more than 80 of these, so it's quite important back in the day. Inscriptions were also left on these mirrors as well, like family wealth, eternal joy, anything to preserve their memory. I would much rather have a giant mirror than a tombstone after I pass away, but it's gotta be a funhouse mirror, because any other mirror is uh, scary. And also, I can't get my hands on these ones. They're a little bit, they're slim pickings, only 80 of these. Number seven, John Wen. This kinda gives off Anastasia vibes a little. A prince thought to be alive after he was destroyed in a fire. Mm. In 1402, the main capital of Nanjing, a fire was smoldering beneath political strife. The capital was invaded by the emperor's own uncle, Zhu Di. He later accused his own nephew of being corrupted and lying to the people. Finally, the storm that had been brewing for years erupted. A rebellion was launched by his uncle with the aim of getting rid of the emperor's ministers and for Di to take power. He destroyed the palace by fire while the emperor was still inside. Three bodies were recovered from the wreckage, assumed to be the bodies of John Wen, his Empress and their eldest son. His uncle soon declared himself emperor, but the people believed that John Wen had escaped. Rumors that he smuggled out just in time and was living as a monk somewhere else in China circulated. His uncle tried to erase any trace of his legacy, but the people remembered, just kind of like Anastasia. Yeah. Number six, ancient seismograph. Zhang Heng, a Chinese astronomer and a mathematician born in 78 AD, created the world's first seismoscope in 132 AD. And it's absolutely weirdly gorgeous. I mean, look at this thing. So what would happen was, Heng figured this out, that when an earthquake hit, this pendulum inside the urn would move, as do most things during an earthquake. And in turn, when it picked up vibrations, it dropped a ball out of the mouth of the ancient metal dragon. The ball then falls into one of the mouths of a metal frog, making a beautiful but concerning clang sound. Now apparently the first time this happened, nobody even felt a thing, but days later, when a messenger finally arrived, it was then told that an earthquake did in fact happen. This type of ancient knowledge blows my mind. Like this guy changed the world. Not too mysterious per se, but rather impressive how he was able to figure this out. Number five, feet binding. Beauty is pain, am I right? <laughs> Oh no. We humans spend a lot of time trying to be attractive for one another, and in ancient China, tiny feet they were awesome. The tinier the feet, the more attractive they were. With bound feet, a woman's beauty was enhanced. Some were even bound to be 10 centimeters in size. So small. It was also a status symbol because the rich didn't need to work. Because as you can guess, having deformed feet prevented women from being able to leave the house. So if you were poor, you didn't bind your feet. It was a painful process. They would soak the feet in warm water mixed with herbs and animal blood. Then they would curl the toes over the sole of the foot and wrap it in cloth, breaking the toe was in the arches so that it could be as small as possible. Oof. It wasn't until 1912 that it was actually banned. Number four, the number four, literally. Some numbers are quite lucky when it comes to Chinese culture. The number eight, for example, if you had an apartment on the eighth floor, it would sell for a higher price than that of the seventh. And no, it's not because seven, eight, nine, but rather because the number eight is pronounced ba, which sounds familiar to fa, as in fakai, which translates to becoming rich or well off. The 2008 Beijing Olympics kicked off on August 8th at 8.08 p.m., eight seconds in. It's a big deal still to this day, but the number four, on the other hand, over here is even more unlucky than the number 13. It's bad juju, the number four. It actually causes traffic to this day in Beijing. Let me explain. The number four sounds a lot like the word death, so buildings don't have this number as a floor even. It goes two, three, five. Although if you're on floor five, you know what's up. The traffic problem though, that's when it gets intense. See, Beijing has a vehicle plate program set in order to maintain the flow of traffic and also to help out with pollution. Depending on which numbers end in your plate, so on weekdays, private cars with plates ending in two digits, zero to nine, are not allowed to drive in Beijing's fifth ring road all day. So if your number is on a certain day, you need to find another route to work. Makes sense. So the lucky numbers are used more often, which means more traffic on those days, but if you had a plate ending in four, that's just 2% of all cars. 
You're flying to work. You're laughing on the way to work. It's easy. You're there in two minutes. Number three, terracotta warriors. Shin Shi Huang, who lived around 259 to 210 BCE, was not only an infamous conqueror in life, but he desired to be the same in death. He wanted to be immortalized, so he decided to build himself an immaculate tomb. It was basically an underground city guarded by the famous life-size terracotta warriors. But not only that, it was complete with gardens, stables, horses, bronze, ritual vessels, jewelry, and he heaps of treasure. This immaculate piece of art represented many of the ways in which the first emperor left an impression on his civilization. During his reign, he introduced standardized currency, writing, mathematical measurements, and plenty more. He was a military genius, though his methods were basically massacres. He was credited for unifying states together. But his underground city of immortality remains one of his most mysterious footprints he left, making sure the world never forgot him even thousands of years later. Number two, you're in trouble. We've done lists now on numerous ancient cultures, and the way that they use their natural gift of water, you know, varies. Romans would use their urine to wash their clothes, ancient Egyptians would pee on barley to predict a newborn sex, in ancient China, over 150 gallons of urine was often collected in this giant pan, and then it was boiled until it evaporated. The result was something called autumn mineral, this crystallized urine residue that's later given to patients to consume. Yummy. Urine eggs were also a thing. That's when you boil an egg for an entire day in the not so mellow yellow. When it came down to smelling good in ancient China, the wealthy would wear scented bags. But if you weren't well off, you had to wash up with urine, just as the Romans did. And last but not least, the lake of wine. A lake of wine? Sign me up! I'm in. I'm diving in. I prefer the grape variety just like King Zhou. It's tough to be a king, but he was resolved to make sure he had a damn good time. He must have loved the OG charcuterie boards because this dude ordered the construction of a pool of wine and a forest of meat. What? A pool of wine, I can imagine. A forest of meat? No idea. The pool was massive, big enough to fit several canoes. In the middle of the pool was a little island with a tree made out of skewers of meat. Creative. Uh, Zhao and his concubines would pass the time floating around the pool of wine, plucking off meat and living their best life. Sounds awesome. Honestly, I'd be in. However, his decadence didn't really please his people. Um, kind of like a Marie Antoinette deal, and they began uprising. And as soon as he realized this was happening, instead of you know addressing it, he, he set himself on fire. So I think his time can be summarized by Trooper. We're here for a good time, not for a long time. Number 10, feet pics. There's a lot of people on the internet, and a lot of those people are kind of strange. But perhaps the strangest group on the interwebs are the same people who enjoy the interwebbing of toes. Yep, looking at the people who love feed pics. Hey, I'm not judging. All I'm saying is that I'm gonna keep my Air Force Ones away from you guys. I don't want you guys looking at my Air Force Ones. Don't look at my Air Force Ones like that. Where does such a phenomenon come from? Well, it may be ancient China and its tradition of foot binding. Yes, if you didn't know, it was a custom for women to bind their feet into a very unique shape, said to have been inspired by the emperor's ladies of the evening after a most graceful dance. Women in China wanted to follow suit and started binding their feet. What's crazy? is how crazy their feet looked afterwards. A painful process that often had ill side effects. Toenails would often become ingrown and cause infection. Sometimes nails were removed completely to prevent infection. If you gotta remove your toenails to wear shoes, I don't know if that's good for you. Thankfully this has fallen out of practice and is kept away from the people who have a thing for feet. Number 9. You and what army? If there was an invention that would make you rich, it would be something that allows you to bring your favorite possessions into the afterlife. Egyptians wanted to bring gold and kitties. Vikings were buried with swords. I mean, after all, you can't go to heaven without a piece. I get it. And when I pass on, like many folks of my generation, we will take crippling anxiety and depression with us. Or so we'll try. Many have tried to take many different things into the afterlife, but strangely, they all get left behind here. The most obtuse example of this is the Terracotta Army. You might have heard of this one before, but honestly, it's so cool. Emperor Chin woke up one morning and thought, hey, what if I need an army in the afterlife? So a Terracotta Army was constructed. I didn't think there was this many, but there's actually over 6,000 life-size Terracotta soldiers who originally wielded real swords and blades. Building an army to protect you in the afterlife is a bold move, Emperor. Number eight. 
unified workforce. Today it takes a lot of hard work to be next to the president. A lot of education, a small loan of a million dollars, and yes manning your way up Capitol Hill. It is a tried and true formula. However, politicians and advisors of ancient China had a rather different and messed up price to pay to be on the emperor's side. A lot of the emperor's advisors were eunuchs, which if you didn't know, it's somebody who had their meat in veg removed if you know what I'm saying. Usually a punishment for a crime, but sometimes self-inflicted to join the ranks of the emperor's court. Yeah, that's right. Dudes were racing to do that to themselves so they could be a part of the emperor's court. These guys even held some power, actually, a surprising amount. Part of the thought was if you couldn't give birth to a child or a successor, then you wouldn't feel the Sith-like urge to power grab and overthrow the Emperor. While I'm sure this may have been effective at first, somebody had to be questioning these methods. Between a bag full of criminal sausage and the guy on the chopping block, this is really messed up. Number 7. Eggs a la pee pee. Continuing with the theme of the warm yellow stuff, we got a cuisine item here that I'm not sure most folks at home would want. I'm sure you guys would pass this up. In the ancient city of Dongyang, a delicacy called something that you two won't let me say, the recipe goes as follows. Pot of eggs, check. Add some urine from people under the age of 18. And boil. Like mentioned before, the golden liquid is supposed to have some sort of medicinal properties. This is usually the part of the script where after my mildly funny joke, I diffuse the chaos by stating that certain practices like these are no longer done. Went away with the old time, we didn't want it anymore. Oh, on the contraire, my cyber surfing friends, weirdly enough, it is still done today. It's said that the taste is like that of springtime. Winter is my favorite season anyway. This is just one of the things you'll just never forget. Number six, yellow crystals. I hope you're not eating breakfast while listening to this part, but here we go. To make a long story short, ancient China is credited with inventing endocrinology. This involves separating hormones from human secretions. That word sounds really gross. How did ancient China accomplish hormone studies without microscopes, lab coats, and a government budget? Ancient Chinese secret. Nah, I'm just kidding, they use pee. You get the whole village together, right? Which includes 150 men, and then they all urinate into a pot. You cook the said yellow mixture of evil, and you boil it down till there's nothing left but crystals. You can't inject things yet, cause there's no needles, so the only way to get it in you is eating it. Oh yeah, that's right sports fans, eating yellow rocks for medicinal purposes. Urine was thought to have some sort of medicinal property, so I, I, I guess this makes sense? I... Come on over man, come have some of my, wanna, wanna try my soup dude? I got some, got some pea soup bro. Number five, Cricket Gladiator. They say that if bread is the first necessity of life, then recreation is a close second. A quote that the ancient Chinese lived by. Blood sport being a common denominator of the day. So were the Chinese warriors dueling it out with martial arts and unique fighting techniques? Or cricket fights? Ah, yeah, you guessed it, cricket fights. Cricket fights were a form of gambling and hobby that pitted male crickets against one another. This was the real deal too. These crickets were treated like prize horses today. These bad boys were bred for the sport, extremely violent and ready to destroy. Actually, unlike other harsh and cruel gambling sports, cricket fighting often didn't end up harming the cricket. While being kept in a clay pot, they were fed good diets and even had female crickets dropped in the pot right before a fight. Just so the little guys know what he was fighting for out there. You go get him, Tiger. Go get him. Number four of lice and men. You guys love your hygiene videos, as we've done a lot here on this channel. And you don't need an expert to tell you that as humans, we did some really gross stuff in the past. Well, if this doesn't make you want to refund your lunch, I don't know what does. Folks back in ancient China had a lice problem. You might be thinking to yourself, oh, I had lice as a kid. That's no big deal. Well, back then it was. See, people had so many lice that people would just pick them off and eat them. I mean, come on. Are you really gonna let all that juicy protein go to waste? Doctors would recommend eating ash to aid people that had stomach aches from consuming too many of the bugs. They also used lice to determine how healthy someone was. If lice were crawling all over the person, they would live. But if the lice were jumping off the person like a rat fleeing a sinking ship, they would not live. You can tell this was a time of great medical knowledge and understanding. With that logic, a corpse with flies around it still has a good chance of making it to work the next morning. Number three, the Black Death. This Silk Road was an economic and political trade agreement made and traveled by empires in Asia and Eastern Europe on multiple trade routes that expanded culture, technology, and learning. But of course, that wasn't the only thing being exchanged. 
change. Unfortunately for traders and people just trying to live their lives, the bubonic plague was making its rounds and spreading along the Silk Road. Sadly, the bubonic plague would claim millions of lives across the old world. The grossest part being the acral necrosis. Acral necrosis is the black discoloration of the skin of the extremities due to decreased blood supply to the affected areas. That lovely symptom is probably how it became to be known as the Black Death. Thanks, Silk Road. Number two, scabs are us. The Black Death might have been the biggest and baddest disease of the ancient world, but it wasn't the only one. There were other bad characters in that bunch. Meet smallpox, another very contagious disease that would start with a red rash and develop into small pustules. They then turned into scabs and fell off. Top Chinese doctors at the time thought, hey, what if we give the scabs to people in hopes they build an immunity? Like some sort of pseudo barbaric vaccine. So they took scabs from sick patients and, after for sure washing their hands, crushed the scabs into a powder and blew it up people's noses with a pipe. It kind of worked, but a lot of people died in the process. Man, what a time to be alive, or maybe dead. With healthcare like that, you're probably just not gonna live too long anyway. Number one, the century of humiliation. The 1800s were not a hot time for China, and yes, I can hear you, I know what you're gonna say. It wasn't exactly ancient times. The 1800s are kind of considered to be modern times, but, but, China had one little problem. China had been pillaged and bullied by foreign powers, which if you couldn't tell is never good for your country. And really, you need to sit down in history class to fully understand everything that was going on up to this point. China just wasn't as modern as the other countries at the time and still had a feudal dynasty in a sense. The point I'm trying to get to is the Taiping Rebellion was messed up. Multiple factors led and caused the rebellion and like I always say, it wouldn't be good history without a little blood. And after the Opium Wars, which was involved with that and a cause and effect, a famine and some other diseases that actually weren't pee related, millions were dead as the century did become to know the century of humiliation. Number 10. Tea. I honestly don't think I could make it through the day without a cup of tea in the morning. The Brit in me just can't do it. But I owe this to China. Specifically, I owe this to Chinese Emperor Shenong from way back in 2737 BC. Now listen to this story. Once upon a time, Emperor Shenong liked to drink hot water. One day, while out on a march with his army, they stopped to rest and catch their breath. At the camp, a servant was preparing Shenong's hot water when a leaf from a tree fell and landed in the water, turning it brown. Instead of discarding the new liquid, it was presented to the emperor, who drank and found it refreshing. Boom! Tea. While used as medicine before this, in the Tang Dynasty, it really became a common beverage enjoyed by many. This time period from 616 to 908 AD also saw the Book of Tea, written by Lu Yu, which contained ways to cultivate tea, tea drinking, and different classifications of tea in details. Thanks, Lu Yu. You the best. Number 9. Compass. A vast sea all drunken sailors and maybe Jack Sparrow, depending on how long the trial lasts. We'll see how it goes. The invention of the compass hails from the ancient land to the east. I learned again today. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. Way back in the Han Dynasty, the first use of the compass was accomplished with a lodestone. For those who forgot what that was from their grade 4 museum field trip, tisk tisk, it will be on the test later, as well as some vocabulary in English. A lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet and aligns itself with the magnetic field, brother. While only used for land at first, it wasn't long before it made its way onto a boat, where it speculated it was traded off into the Islamic world and eventually the west. My only experience with the compass was in Minecraft, and it doesn't point north, it points to spawn. Boy, did I learn the hard way. Number eight, movable type printing. Fun fact, the first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. While the printing press would come much later in Europe, the idea of being able to print identical copies without handwriting began 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty. You see, before this point, if you wanted to pass on the good word of your religion, or teach somebody something, or tell somebody about the past, or give secret little I love you notes to each other, you had to either do it by word of mouth or handwriting. <coughs> Gross. Then, in the previously mentioned Han Dynasty, people began stone tablet rubbing, which evolved into carving words and pictures onto a stone board, lathering that bad boy up with ink and pressing it onto paper. And boom, that's printing. 
But then, in 1041 to 1048, a guy named Bai Sheng carved characters on identical pieces of clay which he hardened by baking, resulting in pieces of movable type that could be stored and used again later. And now we have printers. Innovation, am I right? Number seven, gunpowder. Okay, sure, we all know what gunpowder is and what it does. After all, what's a soldier without his blam blam? A cowboy without his big iron, or a pirate ship without cannons? I'd argue those things are nothing without that. However, I'd like to think of a more peaceful use, and not just because YouTube sweats when I bring up pistols. I remember a long time ago where my father would get a bucket from the Shmoam Depot. He'd fill it up with sand, and we'd walk to a secluded part of the suburban area and launch fireworks. Sometimes we'd launch them into the streets, but that depended on how much rye he had. Depends. At least there was a bucket. Safety first, right? Well, none of that would have been possible without the invention from China. Gunpowder was invented by Chinese alchemists in the 9th century. Originally, it was made by mixing elemental sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, potassium nitrate. The charcoal traditionally came from the willow tree, but grapevine, hazel, elder laurel, and pine cones have all been used in the process. Number six, deep drilling. The province of Sichuan in ancient China, yes, like the sauce, was landlocked and about 1,200 miles from the sea. Because of that, they ain't got no sea salt. So, in order to get salt, the ancient Chinese from around the 2nd century BC developed drilling technology to get brine from deep in the earth, which naturally forms from evaporation of ground saline water. Look at that, we're all learning today. Salt is obviously quite an important resource, but the boring and drilling technology only got better and better, resulting in more and more resources to be found, like natural gas, <laughs> which could be used as fuel. And in the 11th century, the Chinese had the technology to be able to drill those suckers up to 3,000 feet deep, which is pretty deep in case you did not know. Number five, silk. I, for one, was always too broke to afford silk, especially after fireworks. Those bad boys are super expensive. Silk was an important thing in ancient China for the main reason that they invented the process of harvesting silk and were keeping it an ancient Chinese secret. Now, when you have a stockpile of a very valuable raw material that nobody else can get their hands on, and you have a stockpile of the finished product of which is a quality of clothing no one else can match, well, you're gonna be quite wealthy. Well, I don't need to pitch this in the Shark Tank. It's time to start selling and trading, and that's just what China did. This was a very profitable trade, so it got its own road, or roads, the Silk Road wasn't just, just one. The people who were buying from China loved it so much that they wanted their own instead of paying exuberant prices. But it took them a long time to figure out what the process actually was. They thought it grew on trees. It comes from Number four, acupuncture. Have you ever had acupuncture done? Have you ever had acupuncture done? I've not. Neither have I. Let us know in the comments. I want to know if it actually works. When I was looking up this topic, it was called pseudoscience and said that there was no actual scientific proof that it works. Whether it does or doesn't, the practice of acupuncture is ancient. We know this from a less ancient book called the Neijing that was written around 305 BC to 204 BC and was the earliest book of Chinese medicine we know of. It was also called the classic of internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. Who was the Yellow Emperor? Well, that would be Huang Di, whose period lasted from 2697 to 2597 BC. And this guy, this emperor, revolutionized the practice of acupuncture. So all of that was a very long, long-winded way of saying that acupuncture as a practice has been around for more than 4,722 years. Look, writing videos is hard, okay? Just give me a break. Number three, earthquake detector. Earthquakes are a big problem. It's an issue in California as they're still waiting for the big one. It's a problem in Pokemon. When the gym leader I thought was going to be easy surprises me with an earthquake and like one shots my team. And it was a problem in ancient China. I've already experienced one before myself in real life. And if I had to describe to anyone what it felt like, it felt like the ground was a waterbed. Some of you are probably not gonna know what a waterbed is, but that's what it felt like. Well, it was so much of an issue that Zhang Hang made the groundbreaking invention of a seismometer, a device that can detect ground movement. It can't predict them, but it can tell you where they're coming from, using vibrations and tiny balls that would fall into frog-shaped cups depending on which direction it was coming from, something that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the compass from earlier. Oh, interesting. Number two, beer. First tea, now beer? Oh, wait, no, first beer. The earliest recorded consumption of beer was in China 9,000 years ago. I could kiss these people. 
two of my favorite beverages. That said, I'm moving back in time to ancient China. Only, this beer wasn't exactly the same as the kind of beer we would think of made of barley. They used rice, hawthorn, honey, and grapes to make their beer. This 4 or 5% alcohol was mentioned in inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, so that would be 1600 BC to 1046 BC. But pottery from around 7000 BC contains traces of this same kind of alcohol. That's before even the Egyptian pharaohs. And three and a half to 4,000 years before the Sumerians created the Western modern day interpretation of beer. The liquid was known as Zhu in Chinese and is often used as a spiritual offering to the heavens and the earth or to ancestors. And you know what? It still is, baby. Number one, paper money. The Zhaozi currency was the first time in history we used paper money. The stacks, the wad, the dough, the shkarol, the Benjamins, the Bordens, dead presidents, and the bread. There's no greater feeling than walking into a mall with a wad of cash, is there? JC Penny, here I come. Well, we have ancient China to thank for that. Well, sort of. Coins and metal were still more common and used for hundreds of more years before we started printing. In reality, the paper makes more sense. Before printing, coins could have been manipulated into making doubles or counterfeit. There wasn't a press yet. But with paper, it could be issued certain identifiers and used for certain things. The problem with the Jiaozi money is that it wasn't backed by anything. So it did cause a little bit of uh, what my generation knows too much, inflation. Number 10, the War of Unification. While technically pre-Empire, the Qin Wars of Unification are sick and nobody can stop me from talking about them. Prior to their campaign, the relatively small state of Qin had evolved to gain a surprising degree of prominence becoming one of the seven major states in power at the time. Now this was due to the numerous battles centuries prior that I can't talk about this time, but I, I promise they were really cool. Uh, one of which was actually credited as basically being responsible for the unification of China, despite it having ha occurred like 40 years prior. Just look up the Battle of Shangping. It was wild. In any case, the War of Unification was a result of this, running from uh, 230 to 221 BC. It saw Ying Zheng declaring war on the states of Han, Zhao, Wei, Yan, and Qi, conquering them in just about that order. This led to a complete unification of China, an effort which only took barely a decade to complete. Number 9. The Dazhejian Uprising Skipping ahead a bit into the future, following the spoilers, death of Qin Shi Huang, there were a bunch of uprisings. Also known as the Chen Sheng and Wu Guang Rebellion, named after its respective leaders, the uprising began when two officers were ordered to lead their soldiers to defend Yu Yang. Halted by flooding, they realized that due to Qin laws, being late for their government job would result in their executions without respect for the excuse. So they did what anyone would do. Rile up the peasants and go for a good old revolution. And better than getting slaughtered for missing a shift, right? Well, they thought so. And managed to get around 900 peasants to back their cause. How they did this isn't completely confirmed, but there are two stories about how they might have gone about the process, and both are really weird. See, one story goes that Chen Sheng and Wu Guang wrote the words King Chen Sheng on some silk, and then fed that silk to a fish. When the fish was purchased and presumably cut open by soldiers, they saw the message and thought it was sick. Another story goes that they supposedly taught animals to say, Da Chu flourishes King Chen Shang, which likely would have had a similar effect on anyone who heard that from like a cow. So now, these might be slightly embellished, but they're also really funny, so come on. Either way, they got stopped by the cheap, so it doesn't really matter. Number eight, getting owned zoned by a peasant. Now, we're getting outside of the actual reign of the Qin again, but uh, I don't care. The Qin dynasty post-death of Qin Shi Huang was an absolute mess. Leaders were desperately trying to consolidate power, body their opposition, and avoid getting bodied in the process. The effective orchestrators of the chaos, Li Si and Zhao Gao, who we will get to, had a massive falling out which resulted in Li Xi's execution. Zhao Gao was trying to run everything, deposing the old emperor in favor of a new one, who then got rid of Zhao Gao. But the new emperor, Ji Ying, was a moron, and so eventually a real revolt uh, broke out in uh, 209. 
the rebels of Chu, led by uh, Lieutenant uh, Liu Bang and leader Zhang Yu, managed to defeat Ji Ying in 207 BC. Of course, in traditional period fashion, Liu Bang betrayed Zhang Yu and founded the Han Dynasty, despite being a peasant. I have been in car accidents that have had less whiplash than the last like two years of the Qin Dynasty. Oh, and uh, Liu Bang was like a peasant, by the way, a, a, a peasant who became the ruler of China. Number seven, the Terracotta Warriors. Okay, so you probably know a little bit about this one. In 1974, a bunch of farmers in the Lin Tong County managed to dig up this exceptional find. Three pits containing statues of 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. Construction on the tomb began during Qin Shi Huang's reign. He had a thing about dying, but uh, we'll get into that later. And the soldiers were originally painted, though due to the climate and about roughly two millennia of time, it uh, kind of faded. There have been arguments that some of the paint could have been sourced from Greece, although the idea that the Greeks and the Qin Dynasty ever made content is hotly contested, so I'm not getting into that. But it can't really be stated in words how massive this project was. Every soldier was armed. Every single one constructed by hand, and the tomb itself is about 98 square kilometers, or you know, 38 square miles for the Yanks in the audience. Easily one of the single most impressive pieces of architecture known to man, it's just yet another impressive reminder of the exact scale and scope of the Qin Dynasty. Number 6. The Twelve Statues Alright, story time! So, when Qin Shi Huang defeated the six other states in his quest for dominance, he demanded that every single conquered state hand over all of their weapons to him. He then melted those weapons and reportedly had them cast into 12 massive metal statues and a couple of bells or something. Each were reported to weigh about a thousand don, or roughly 133,000 pounds. Now, where are these colossi now? Well, a few centuries after the fall of Qin, Emperor Emperor Dong Zhuo reportedly had about nine of them melted down to make coins. However, because the statues were made out of a hodgepodge of different metals, and more importantly because Dong Zhuo is a moron, uh, the coins didn't weigh the same, which resulted in the mass devaluing of all copper cash. I really want to do a video on Lu Bu, and specifically how he offed Dong Zhuo. The guy, that guy was a creep. Anyways, uh, as for the other three statues, nobody really knows where they are, so maybe there's another discovery on a similar level to the Terracotta Warriors on the horizon. Number 5. Book Burning this is one of the more tragic stories, but it's gotta be talked about. During Qin Shi Huang's rule, Chancellor Li Shi convinced the emperor that all records excluding the Qin needed to be burned. Not only that, but anyone possessing copies of the Shi Jing, the Shu Jin, and or any other writings from the hundred schools of philosophy had to turn their copies in for summary roasting or they'd get whacked. Not only that, but he suggested a mass state of censorship which was the actual censorship and not the kind that you uh, right-wing morons whine about happening in video games or whatever. Hmm? Basically, anyone who referenced the books, talked about them in any way, or god forbid used them to criticize the government, were to be borked brutally and quickly. Qin Shi Huang thought this was a great idea and got to work erasing thousands of collections of poetry, history, and philosophy. He even went out of his way to execute 460 scholars whom he just happened to overhear complaining about his stupid new rules. I would weep about this loss for hours, but poet Zhang Ji's work titled Pits for Book Burning is far better for it than I. Quote, As the smoke from burning bamboo and silk clears, the empire is weakened. The Hangu Pass and the Yellow River guard the domain of Qin Shi Huang in vain. Pits of ash were not yet cold. Disorder reigned east of the Zhao Mountains. As it turned out, Liu Bang and Zhang Yu could not read. Number four, high speed cultural revolution. We've said it already, but it really can't be overstated that the speed in which Qin Shi Huang implemented new cultural rules and laws was absolutely incredible. Even the Meiji Restoration period that effectively brought Japan into what was considered the modern age for that time, it took about around 21 years. And that was a messy affair that could get an entire video by itself. But consider the relative population contained within 
China. Consider the size of China and the size of the Qin Empire. All of this territory was shaped by a period of about a decade and a half, to the point where it wouldn't be until 1912 that there would be a major upheaval to the system. Obviously, it saw improvisation, adaptation, and change over the years, but just as Qin Shi Huang was laying the foundation for a wall that he envisioned would span the entirety of China, I wonder if he knew that the system of government that he was implementing would last nearly as long. Of course, the means by which this was achieved involved massive cultural manipulation and fascistic ideals, not to mention the body count. Actually, no, let's mention that. Number three, the body count of Qin rule. Okay, now while the Qin dynasty was important, it should be noted that the results of such a tyrannical rule were bloody indeed. Between high taxes, wars of conquest, and the beginning of the construction of the Great Wall, historians estimate that around 20 million people passed during Qin rule. An absolutely staggering number given, again, its decade and a half duration. The construction of the wall alone was estimated to have contributed to around one million of those, and it wasn't finished until long after Qin fell. It's a sobering reminder to keep in mind that while acts of war are devastating, the management or mismanagement of those in power can be far more destructive. Number two, Qin Shi Huang's quest for immortality. So it uh, turns out it ain't great to be king. As his reign continued, Qin Shi Huang's paranoia increased, only emboldened as three consecutive attempts on his life were made. This this paranoia turned to obsession with the elixir of life, a fabled drink which might imbue him with immortality. His quest led him on a search for the Penglai Mountain, where a thousand-year-old magician had supposedly invited him. Qin Shi Huang had also ordered an expedition to search for the elixir, but they uh, never returned, likely due to being afraid of the consequences for returning empty-handed. It's actually suspected that uh, some of them did escape to Japan and may have settled there, though accounts in this area are pretty weak. Anyways, in uh, 211, a meteor landed in Donjun, and some cheeky bugger inscribed the words, The first emperor will die and his lands will be divided. Since nobody took credit for the masterful prank, everyone in the area was executed, and the stone destroyed. Finally, Qin Shi Hong passed, potentially due to illness, but as many fun stories go, it's actually rumored that he was killed by a seditious physician with a false illness containing mercury. Number one, Li Shi's return. It's fortunate that the end of the Qin Empire is as interesting as its beginning. Qin Shi Huang is dead, and Li Shi and chief eunuch Zhao Gao have to somehow keep everything together. For starters, there was the job of getting the emperor's body back, which they handled by hiding it in a caravan of dead fish. Seriously. But they had another problem. They just flat out didn't want the emperor's choice of successor, Fu Su, to take the throne as it'd probably mean that they'd lose their jobs. So betraying the newly passed emperor, they tricked Fusu into taking his own life by giving him a falsified document from his dad that just told him to do it. Zhao Gao then betrayed Li Shi, charging him with treason, and the conspirator was subjected to the five punishments. Mo, where the offender is tattooed on the face with ink. Yi, where the offender's nose is cut off. Yu, or Yue, where the offender's feet are cut off, Gong, where the offender's are removed, and finally Da Pi, which was carried out by chopping at the waist. It'd be easy to say that Li Si was half the man he aimed to be, but just please cut the joke here, that was really stupid. Yeah.